Come up to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter, toward the back of your Bible. 1 and 2 Peter, 1 and 2 and 3 John. Right? Isn't that how it goes? Jude and Revelation, something like that. So toward the end, 2 Peter. We are studying through this book, just kind of going verse by verse. I love to do this from time to time, just kind of take a, usually a shorter book. I've never taken like Jeremiah, you know, and studied it through verse by verse because it'd be three years later. Um, but usually take a bit of a shorter book or a story and go through, you know, a, a line at a time. And there's many reasons for that, but one of them just has to do with wanting to expose us all to the pattern of reading the Bible. Um, I want to kind of just get us familiarized with going through text and kind of pulling stuff out. And, uh, you know, I've been studying my Bible for a long, long time. I started the pattern of reading my Bible when I was in junior high school. Um, and so, you know, it's not necessarily that you think, oh, man, I can't read my Bible if I can't pull out stuff like this. I mean, I spend hours on these outlines. So it's not that we all have time to go through and, like, pull out profound thoughts from every, not that my thoughts are that profound, but, you know, uh, <laughs> But just the pattern of getting into the Bible on a regular basis and learning to listen for God's voice. The Bible says of itself that it's alive and that it's active. And man, when you get into the pages of the Bible and just start saying, God, when you come to the Bible, not just as a discipline or an exercise, but as a source of nourishment and encouragement, like you know, eating food, or those of us who are addicted to coffee, you know, having your coffee, that's my pattern in the morning. It's coffee and the Bible. It's like, I need them both, man. Uh, and my, my day does not go well, right? You know what I mean? Um, but when we come to it with this, with this anticipation, God, would you speak to me? Would you encourage me? Would you refresh me? I mean, every, you know, it, it does happen where you read the Bible and you're just like, whatever that was, right? But sometimes I drink cups of coffee and I don't recognize that I drank it either, so it doesn't mean I don't need it. Sorry, I should, this works better with food, right? This works better with food. Not every meal that you eat is like something to write home about. Sometimes you just eat it because it's good for you, right? And, or at least it should be. Uh, we try to eat healthy. Uh, this analogy, I'm taking way too long. There's a whole path, path. You get what I'm trying to say. When we come and say, Jesus, speak to me, and we do that on a regular basis, uh, there's really nothing that be, ends up becoming, well, there are many things that change our lives. Sorry. It's really good. You should try it. All right. <laughs> you know, you get a microphone in front of yourself, and it's like, it's really amazing how all the smart thoughts can disappear. <clears throat> Continuing along. Second Peter, uh, we studied the first half of chapter one last week, so if you'd like to pick up, if you see stuff in there that jumps out at you, you can pick that up on our YouTube channel, um, Coastlands, Coastlands Church, just search for that on YouTube and you'll find our channel and, and uh, stuff's there. Um, but continuing along from verse 12, therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities, and he's referencing back to the list of qualities that he had given in the first half of the chapter, things like virtue and self-control and knowledge and godliness and brotherly affection and love. He's reminding us of all these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it is right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the, uh, that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. So a um, couple of thoughts here, just that he is saying, I want to stir you up by way of reminder. And what this whole book, what this whole letter is really targeted at is to help, the, help Peter's friends be able to identify false teaching that was floating around in the early church and still floats around absolutely floats around today, and so that's why we're studying this, is because it's important to be able to discern the difference between something that's really true and something that's going to lead us off track. We'd like to think that identifying lies would be pretty straightforward, uh, but actually we're all very vulnerable, and so really focusing on, okay, how do we discern the difference between truth and lies, between good teaching and false teaching, uh, how, do we, how do we figure that out? 
Um, but the first thing he's saying, well, the second thing he's saying, because the first thing was last week's teaching, but the second thing he's getting onto is saying, hey, I know you know a lot of this stuff already. I know you've heard this before, but I want to stir you up by way of reminder. And to me, that's important because it reminds me that the things that are the most true are often easy to forget, that, that, I, that I need to be reminded, I need to be refreshed. And oftentimes when I'm hearing things that I've heard before, I can quickly tune out and think kind of like, oh yeah, I know that already. And what Peter's trying to say is be careful. Don't think that way. If you think, I know that already, it's probably something you really need. <laughs> That's the moment you most need to pay attention because as soon as I feel like I'm in that mode where it's like, yeah, whatever, you know, I've heard this before, I'm already starting to veer off track. Does that make sense? The truths that are the most potent to keep us on track really only work when I let my heart be impacted freshly by them again and again and again. So I want to stir you up by way of reminder. You know this stuff. You're living it out. It's really great, but come on, let's stay on track. We tend to get tired of doing good stuff. There's even a verse that says, don't grow weary of doing good. So life in God following Jesus is the very best life that's available to us. Um, it's way better and more fulfilling and more satisfying and more refreshing than not following Jesus. I've had times of my life where I was not following Jesus, right? And that wasn't a fun life. This is a better life, but that doesn't mean it's easy. These qualities that God calls us to of virtue and love, you know, brotherly affection, it's, it's, uh, that, we, that means is that I'm going to, God's calling me to believe the best of every person that I come in contact with. No matter how many times I'm disappointed by people's attitudes and behaviors, I'm not supposed to hold that against them. I'm supposed to just keep giving myself to people in brotherly affection. Man, I just love you. Come here. Let's hug, because I love you. No matter how many times I'm disappointed, feel hurt and betrayed. I'm supposed to give that to Christ because he died on the cross for that and keep looking at people through the eyes of who God made them to be, not through their poor choices. No matter how many times we fail one another, we're called to believe the best and keep investing and keep pouring ourselves out and keep embracing and keep believing. Does this make sense? Does that sound tiring? It is. It's tiring because the disappointments mount up. The betrayals leave you feeling like, what in the world? I thought it was supposed to go different than this. I thought life was supposed to turn out better than this. And Jesus is saying, it will. Hang on. It, it adds up to something really good. That verse I was referencing in Galatians says, don't grow weary of doing good because you will reap in due time if you don't give up. But man, due time. Jesus has one messed up idea of due time sometimes. I don't know about your life, but mine is like, what? 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 Isn't the due time? Didn't it come? Jesus is like, it's coming. Hang on. Keep going. Don't go tired. There's part of us that grows weary, and that's where Peter is saying, I want to stir you up. Come on, remember, remember, this is worth living for. This is worth fighting for. This is worth dying for. Because in due time, we'll reap. And don't believe the lies, because the lies are all founded on this. There's an easier way. It won't cost you so much. It'll turn out better if you just, and all of them will try to get you off track from these character qualities. Love, virtue, godliness, brotherly affection. All the lies are aimed at getting you off track from God's plans for your life and who he's made you to be and into another pattern of living that's way more focused on yourself and what you want rather than what God wants and what he has for you. So I want to stir you up by way of reminder. Verse 16, for we do not follow, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there's a lot in this section, and let's go back and kind of dig into it line by line. First of all, he says, we didn't follow cleverly uh, devised myths when we were telling you about Jesus. And he goes on to uh, describe the scene when he and James and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration, and Jesus' body began emanating heavenly light and the voice from heaven started speaking about Jesus and then of course Elijah and Moses showed up in this whole incredible scene and Peter's freaking out I put the verses there uh, from the story of the gospels on your outline if you want to read that later but he's he's referencing that episode and he's saying we didn't make this stuff up and clearly people have accused him of making this stuff up people have said you're a joker, you're a crazy, you're a loon, you're a whatever, you're on something, whatever it was, but that didn't happen. And he's saying, no, 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 this is the truth. I saw it with my own eyes. We were eyewitnesses, he's saying. Um, And he's contrasting that with cleverly designed myths. What are cleverly designed myths? He's contrasting his eyewitness account with I don't know what the cleverly designed myths are, but there's teachings that are floating around which sound impressive, kind of heady, based on stories, but you don't really know if they're true or not, but wow, that's, that's cool. That's cool stuff. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff out there that sounds impressive, that has logic to it, that is very intriguing or fascinating or alluring, but it's not based on first hand, this is what God did in my life. That's what Peter is saying, I saw it with my own eyes. And that's what we want to offer to each other and to our friends, is here's how it's worked for me. This is my eyewitness account. This is, this is how it's happened for me. Not with lengthy philosophical arguments and like cleverly designed, you know, whatevers. It's just, hey, here's what the Bible says. This is what Peter's saying. He's like, this is what the Bible said would happen. There's the Old Testament prophecies. All the scriptures said uh, that Jesus would come and die and uh, and that he would rise again. And then we saw it happen. So there's two parts. There's, here's what the Bible says. And here's how it's worked in my life. Here's how I've seen it with my own eyes. Here's what the Bible says. And here's what I've seen with my own eyes. That's what Peter's saying here. It's, there's two really important things. Here's what the Bible says. Even if I haven't seen it with my own eyes, what the Bible says is pretty impressive, like worth paying attention to. And then if someone says, here's what I saw with my own eyes, that's also impressive. If someone says they saw something really cool happen, even if it's just a good movie, that influences me. You got to see this movie. It's awesome. I'm like, dude, I totally do. Does that make sense? So an eyewitness account of something that really worked or was fun or any, like, this is what happened and it's awesome. Eyewitness account, that's influential in people's lives. You couple, now that's eyewitness. He's saying, it's the scripture said it would happen That's impressive. The Bible says, blah, 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 blah. That has power to it. But he's saying not only did the Bible say it would happen, but I saw it happen. You couple the Bible with personal experience, here's how it is. And Peter's saying that's what you want to bank your life on. That's the difference between a true teaching and, or that's a difference, not the difference. That's a quality of true teaching is its personal experience based on the Bible. And that's, again, that's what we want to be offering to one another. That's what we want to offer uh, to our friends. 
Um, it's interesting that Peter specifically says that he's an eyewitness of Christ, and he's mom, you know, referencing the transfiguration. And this actually figured heavily in all the New Testament presentations of the gospel. Uh, every sermon that was preached that's recorded in the book of Acts all calls out the fact that, hey, we saw Jesus with our own eyes, which I think we can describe how we've experienced Jesus in our lives, but very few of us have actually seen him with our eyes unless we've had some pretty incredible uh, visions. And I've actually spoken with people who've had that happen. But uh, look at this one passage in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, and I've put this on your outline as well. 1 Corinthians 15, I believe it is, verses 3 through 8. This is Paul. It's a similar passage where he's saying it's about the Scriptures, but it's also about our firsthand experience. So it's a, it follows a similar pattern as what Peter just did. But this is Paul now writing. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, again, accordance with the Scriptures. So he's saying this is what was prophesied in the Old Testament, continuing on that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures that was prophesied, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, continuing on, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the, all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, he's referencing the moment uh, on the road to Damascus when he was blinded and knocked off his horse. So, very interesting that he's saying, okay, the, the scriptures prophesied it, and then lots of us, not just Peter, not just the apostles, but at one moment, there were more than 500 people who saw Jesus alive. And he recommends to his readers, if you don't believe it, go talk to them. Many of them are still alive. They're still living in Jerusalem. Some of them have died, but by the time he's written this letter, he's saying some of them are, a lot of them are still alive. In other words, go ask for yourself. To me, this is one of the most helpful, securing points of faith, uh, is that the church was birthed. I mean, the most important question really about our faith is, did Jesus really die, rise from the dead? Was, did Jesus actually raise from the dead? It's most scholars, there are some scholars who think, well, maybe Jesus didn't even exist, but most scholars, secular, atheists, whatever, most of them are willing to give it to believers <laughs> that Jesus existed, that he was a historical figure, but very few other than believers actually believe he raised from the dead. And what Paul is saying here, what Peter is saying here is, I'm preaching what I'm preaching because he raised from the dead. And I saw it with my own eyes, and also more than 500 people saw it at the same time. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, it would make sense that Peter and the others wouldn't be preaching this message. Does this make sense? Remember after the crucifixion, they went out and they were fishing in their boats. If Jesus did raise from the dead, it does make sense that you'd go out and start preaching. Whoa, he raised from the dead. How cool is this? If Jesus didn't raise from the dead... Uh, then we wouldn't really have the church that we have today. If Jesus did raise from the dead, then it does make sense that Christianity came into fruition because there was this incredible miracle that people just couldn't stop talking about because it was real. The fact that Peter, James, John, all the apostles, and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of the early church believers all died for their faith really goes to help secure points in my life where I think, gosh, is this, are, we, are we making all this up? Is this for real? It just doesn't make sense that these guys would be willing to die for something that didn't actually happen if they had made it up. The other, all the other world religions, if you do some comparative analysis, were born out of cultural majorities and or military dominance. Christianity is a very unique faith in the fact that it was born in the midst of insane persecution. Christianity was birthed right in the middle of persecution, both from the Jewish people and from the Roman people. The Romans hated the Christians, the Jewish people hated the Christians, and they were both seeking to kill all of them. 
and did kill most of them. The fact that the church exists, given that it was born under such circumstances, how could the truth, how could this message have survived that kind of persecution if it were made up? The only reason so many people would be willing to go to their deaths is that it was prophesied in the scripture and I saw it with my own eyes. Now this is something worth dying for. I don't mean to say that that fact can eliminate the need for faith. It doesn't prove anything. But boy, there are times where my faith gets shaken. It's like, is this really all just, we, we just, is this just all the kind of double talk? And there are moments where I need to be secured, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. There were eyewitnesses who were willing to die for the sake of the message of the gospel. And those people handed it down to those people who handed it down to those people. And I'm in that chain of faith. I'm part of that advancement of the kingdom that Jesus promised that, that would, that would you know, ultimately win over every form of evil. One other little detail that always helps me is I remember that James, the brother of Jesus, is the author of the book of James and ended up being the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And I think if James was able to worship Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, and he's Jesus' brother, I don't know about you, but it seems like if anyone was going to know if Jesus really was the perfect, sinless Son of God, it would be Jesus' brother. And if Jesus' brother is like, dude, you are God, I'm thinking... I never thought such things about my brother. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it can really, it doesn't establish faith. Faith is a gift of God that we choose to embrace and nurture. Does this make sense? And faith is always a leap. However, understandings like this can help secure faith if we have it and or bring us to the brink of faith if we don't yet have it, if that, if that makes sense. So that's what Peter is trying to do here. He's saying, guys, don't listen to people who say this is all just myths and lies because it was prophesied in Scripture. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, like 350 plus prophecies in Old Testament Scripture that point to various details of the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's saying this was all prophesied and we saw it with our own eyes. He's saying, don't be shaken in your faith when people come along and say, phooey on all that. You're a fool for believing in some guy that lived 2,000. He's like, no, come on, this is real. This is real. So he continues on and, and says in verse 19, you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. And he's speaking of those Old Testament uh, prophecies. Um, and he's speaking of that truth that God really has touched our lives. That's the lamp, is, um, is the truth of God's word coupled with our experience of, wow, it's really true, it really happened. And that's the light that God has given us. And he's saying, you'll do well to pay attention to the light that God's given you. Because it's a light in a dark place. And it's helpful to remember that we live in a dark place. It's not hospitable to the light. It doesn't always reflect the light that God's given us. And yet God hasn't ever taken the light away from us. We live in a dark place, but he's given us this light that we're called, a, or a lamp if we picture holding it. But the darkness feels overwhelming at times. The darkness can feel enticing, fascinating, overwhelming. It's just, it's so dark. How, could my, how am I supposed to survive this? And the lies come against us saying, you can't. Nothing that you have can really, you know, impact or penetrate the darkness. And we feel the dread and we feel the fear and our hearts race. And Peter's saying, don't give in to the darkness don't believe the lie. You have this lamp. Pay attention to it. It takes discipline to stay focused on the light that God has given us. If he's spoken to you, if he's done something and changed your life at some point, encouraged you, 
He's saying, don't forget that. Hold on to that. Don't be overcome by darkness, but remember what God has done. Hold on to it because it's going to get you through. It's going to lead you through the various seasons that are in front of you. And um, then he references, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Interesting kind of biblical uh, imagery that he's giving here. The morning star is one of Jesus' nicknames. He, uh, refer- he calls himself the morning star in the book of Revelation, and then one of those many hundreds of prophecies that I mentioned to you in the Old Testament s- refers to a star that will rise in Jacob. And so he's, uh, he's the morning star. And so he's saying, uh, hang on to the light that God's given you because there's going to be times of darkness, and you'll need to hold on to the light that he's given you until the morning star rises, the morning star being Jesus. And this is the reality of our lives. There are times where the darkness feels so heavy, so oppressive, so overwhelming that it's just hard to believe that that the light will ever come. And and Peter's saying, I've been there. Now, he's he's in prison facing death. He might be feeling some of this right now as as he's writing the words. He's needing the morning star to rise in his heart. He might be feeling that trepidation and that insecurity. He's the apostle, the first apostle, the leading apostle of the church and all these fledgling churches. And Nero, the persecution is is raging against Christians. And and Nero's persecution, what he does is he rounds up Christians. And I hate to be too graphic, but he he rounds them up, uh, binds them with ropes and, and douses them with fuel and uses them to light his garden parties. And he's writing to his friends and saying, Don't give up. God's going to show up. God's going to rescue you. This is not the end of the story. There are times where the darkness feels so heavy. It feels so oppressive. It feels so hopeless. But he's saying, hold on to the light that you have. He's been there. You've been in those dark places before. He's shown up before. Hold on to the light that you have until Jesus shows up. Because there are times where you're like, God, you're going to show up, right? (laughs) right? We need Jesus. The the, the forces that are oppressing us actually are more powerful than us. They're not more powerful than him, but they are more powerful than us. And so when we feel afraid, there is good reason to be afraid. These forces hate you, and they're trying to kill you. That's scary. They don't want you to live. They don't want you to have a life. They're smarter. They're more powerful. They're after you. They hate you. And so you feel like, how can I make it? How can I make it? And it's a really good question because you can't on your own, which is why it feels so scary and overwhelming. But there's good news. The good news is Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. He's going to rescue you. The threats that you face are not the end of the story, and he's going to overpower them. And in our lives, as we look past, if we've walked with Jesus any amount of time, we can say, Jesus, you've been faithful before. And he's saying, hold on to that light, because that's what's going to get you through until the morning star rises. The idea is there are times that are night where it just is dark and cold, and it feels like the dawn will never, 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 never come. I cannot survive this. But then, bing, the morning star rises. And the morning star is when Jesus shows up in our life again, and he says, I'm here, and I'm powerful. I'm going to bring you through again. And the interesting thing about the morning star that's, the, that's, that's being called out here is that it often precedes Venus's rising for a good chunk of the year, precedes the coming of the dawn. Now, the dawn is actually the picture of Jesus' return. The dawn is the idea that everything until Jesus comes back is nighttime. Sin and death are temporarily in control. Now, it's a little bit confusing because uh, when Jesus, in Matthew 28, after his resurrection, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In other words, he's saying, 
I've won the final victory. I have all authority. Nothing is more powerful than me because I paid the price. Everything that claims to have power and authority is bluffing. I'm the top dog. But then he didn't, at that moment, throw sin and death into the lake of fire, which is what he'll do, in, uh, we see at the end of the story when he comes back. So there's this interim time, there's this, this period of waiting that we're now in, where sin, I don't know if you've ever felt like sin is in charge, <laughs> I sure have, <laughs> Woo! Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> either because I'm drawn into it or because other people seem so drawn into it. And goodness gracious, Jesus, are you really in charge here? And he's like, yep, I am. Hang in there. Um, But it seems like sin and death are in charge because Jesus hasn't come yet to throw them into the lake of fire where they'll burn up and they'll really be no more. So in this interim time, even though Jesus has won the victory, that victory has not been fully mm, realized, really applied, really you know, the gavel has not come down and said, you're out of here. And so in the meantime, there's just so much struggle and there's so much wrestle, and we're going to get to uh, learn more about what that's all about um, and why as we get to chapter 3 in the coming weeks. But for now, uh, it's just important to know that the dawn is coming. And in the meantime, we live in a certain measure of darkness. We have a morning star which will show up in our lives you know, as you're feeling this oppressive weight, as you're living in the darkness, as it feels hopeless and dreadful, the morning star will rise. You will have hope again. You will get through this in your personal life. Don't believe the lie that says that won't happen. But that's true beyond just our personal life. It's true for the cosmos as well. You know, the lie will come against you, as, as, as not just in your little circumstance you're facing. The lie will come against you. What does it matter And it's not just about, again, a a momentary struggle you're facing. It's about your whole life. It's about all of human history. It's like, why bother with anything? It's an existential question. And and that question will be answered when the dawn rises, when sin and death are done away, and we worship, and we praise, and we dance, and we party like it's way beyond 1999. You know what I mean? It's like the wedding supper of the Lamb. I mean, it is the, that's the party you really want to be at. And Jesus foreshadowed it with his first miracle when he took uh, the, 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 the wine that was running out and he said, oh baby, I know how to throw a party. It's the party that never ends. And it was the foreshadowing of heaven. That's where we want to be. That's what we want to believe for. That's what we want to fight for. And that's why we don't want to give up in hopelessness. That's why we want to keep inviting our friends. That's why we want to keep reaching out because the doom and the hopelessness, it's, it, it tries to make some sense out of the darkness. It doesn't know that there's a dawn that's coming. It just tries to make the best that it can out of the darkness that we now have. And that's, that's the essence of what false teaching, back to that concept, what are we doing, talking about here? We're talking about false teaching. The false teaching only concerns itself with the darkness that we now face. It doesn't look ahead to the dawn that is coming. It doesn't look ahead to Jesus is coming, he's going to set everything right. See, when you know that Jesus is coming and he's going to set everything right, You can keep loving people. You can keep believing in people. You can keep believing the best. No matter how much, how many times you mess up and hurt my feelings, I'm going to keep loving you and believing in you. Why? Because that day is coming. And what is wrong about me and wrong about you is not the final story. What's wrong about me and what's wrong about you is soon going to be past, just going to be, it's just gone like that. Pretty soon, we're going to be like, what's up? Yeah, how about that? We were right all along. Every time we press forward in love, in hope, and in faith, we were vindicated. So we have to look forward to a party so that we can deal with the blah of today, right? If you don't know that you're going to a party, you're going to try and make a party out of today. 
and you're going to keep feeling disappointed and frustrated. And what's wrong with people? Why do they keep disappointing me and frustrating me? And Jesus keeps telling me to love them. They don't deserve it. All this kind of stuff. But Jesus says, don't worry about the traumas of today. I mean, yeah, they hurt. I'm sorry about that. We'll get through it together. But believe in that day. Because if you know you're ending up there, then you can navigate with courage, confidence, boldness, willingness, eagerness to pay whatever price uh, that I call you to, to pay on this side. So two basic false teachings about how to navigate the darkness that are in the world, that float around all the time. One of them says, uh, try to overcome it. It doesn't look, it doesn't look ahead to Jesus' rescue. It doesn't look ahead to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It doesn't look ahead to that party. It's only saying, yeah, it's dark. It's dark, all right. But if we just work hard enough and be smart enough and do enough good stuff, then we can somehow overcome the darkness. Okay, so that's one flavor of false teaching in the world. Try hard enough, be smart enough, do enough good stuff, and you're gonna, we're going we're gonna to beat this sucker. Don't give up. But the hope is ultimately in yourself and your effort. Okay, so that's one brand of false teaching, one flavor. There's only two flavors in this ice cream shop. The other flavor is just give up. You know, all those people who are saying you can do so much good, they're just trying to keep you from having fun. Just give in to the darkness and throw a party. Okay? We can create light if we work hard enough or throw a disco ball up and have a party. Okay? That's, that's, those are the kind of the basic two strategies, the two flavors of false teaching that are out there. And you notice that with both of them, it takes the focus off of Jesus, takes the focus off of his rescue, takes the focus off of his future, and it tries to navigate it, putting all of the, putting, putting all of the emphasis on us. Okay, <clears throat> look at, uh, we'll continue on. Chapter 2, starting in verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, righteousness with seven others, uh, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to excuse me, extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormented. Uh, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. This might be one of the few times you hear this passage taught on. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of heavy stuff in here, right? All right. All right. False prophets arise among the people, and there's false te uh, teachers among you who secretly bring in destructive heresies. Let me just tackle that phrase there, that, that sentence. If you're on the outline, I'm on the back side, Roman numeral 6. So a few things I want to pull out from this passage about the nature of false teaching. First of all is the word secretly. Secretly. They secretly bring in destructive heresies. One of the great telltale signs of false teaching is that it's whispered behind closed doors. It feels private. The, 
gospel truth of who Jesus is, it's going to be proclaimed from the rooftops. It's going to be presented out in the open. If someone's like, you know what? I know, I know that's all good stuff that they're talking about, but let me, let's, come on, can we, can we, let me, let's talk about this over here. That's a great little uh, red flag. Secondly, it's destructive, where the truth of who Jesus is is unifying. You feel like, yes, I can't wait to follow Jesus with people. And hopeful, like, yes, there's a future for us. False teaching is, is divisive. It pits you against people. It creates factions. It makes you feel like, ah, they're just doing it wrong. And man, we got to do it like this. It puts the emphasis on people. Remember, there's these two basic forms of false teaching. One says you've got to try harder and do it right. The other says you should just loosen up and have fun. Okay, so if there's these, there's these two kinds of false teaching, someone comes along and says, you know, it, it, it's all those goody two-shoes Christians. If you really want to have fun, again, these are statements that will be sp- spoken in secret, not necessarily secret like, you know, in code, but just this is not a teaching that you're going to hear saying, come on, let's do this together uh, in that sense. So a believer comes along, come on, let's just have some fun. Um, it's destructive. It's divisive. It leads you to uncertainty. Thirdly, it's distracting. Here's how I get that out of this. It says that they secretly bring in destructive heresies that deny the master. That's what I mean by distracting. They deny that it takes your focus off of Jesus. The truth will make you, when you hear good teaching that's going to lead you in a good way, you're going to, at the end of it, say, Who, Jesus, you rip! You rock. I want to follow you. When you hear intriguing ideas, whoa, that's really fascinating. Yeah, maybe we should be doing it like this. And what's their problem? Why aren't they doing it more like this? Does this make sense? It takes your eyes off. A false teaching is going to take your eyes off of Jesus and put it on this, well, we've got to do it right. We've got to try harder. Or, man, they're just trying too hard. They just got to loosen up and just feel the freedom to be themselves. This makes sense. It takes the focus off of Jesus and it says you either have to try harder or you have to loosen up. But where is your focus? It's on yourself. The truth of Jesus will call you to himself and it's in the process of worshiping Jesus. Jesus, you're awesome. Jesus, I want to live for you. Jesus, you died for me. You set me free. You let yourself be enamored with Jesus and you are going to be set free. Does this make sense? You don't have to loosen up. Jesus is going to set you free. Furthermore, you don't have to try hard. You just give yourself to worshiping Jesus, and he's going to set you free with this amazing character, all the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, all this stuff's just going to flow out of you. You don't have to be all disciplined and rigorous, like, look what a great Christian I am because I'm so loving. No, just Love Jesus and let him love you. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to end up being loving. It just happens. So it's distracting because it puts the emphasis on something other than Jesus. And then finally, it's burdensome or alluring because it, again, puts this heavy burden on us. It doesn't focus on the price that he paid. It focuses on putting burdens on people. You know, you got to do it right. You're just messing it all up or alluring because, again, let's just go. Let's just go have some fun. This will turn out great. This won't cost anything. It won't hurt anybody. Let's just do what we feel like doing. And that's the last section has to do with uh, the following, the sensuality. And that's what verse, says, verse 2 says, that they'll follow, many will follow the sensuality. Now, sensuality, we tend to uh, think in terms of sexual uh, sexual temptation, and it certainly can be that, but sensuality is really just false teaching sets us free, removes restraint, so that we basically feel justified in doing whatever we feel like. That's what sensuality is, just whatever you feel like doing, just doing what comes naturally. You know, and for some of us, that is a sexual thing, can feel like, well, I just feel like it, and so if it just feels right, it must be good. 
And there will be false teachings that will come along and give you license and say, yes, you deserve it. You, you, you've been so good. And your partner, she's just so cold. You know, you just, you just really ought to feel free to express yourself, you know, or however it says it. But the false teaching says, do what you feel like doing. That's what the real thing is. And for again, some of us, again, that will manifest uh, sexually. For others of us, it'll be indulging in alcohol or drugs. It can be physical things, but it can also be emotional things. What do I feel like? I feel angry. You know, it's just not fair. I feel jealous. Why do they have that and not me? These are all indulgences. These are all sensualities. It's all just, what do I feel like? And because of this, this, and this, that's the false teaching. Because of these, 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 this, and this, I feel justified in making my statement, making my claim, and therefore, in the end of the story, I get to do what I want. That's the end goal of false teaching, is instead of freeing you to do what Jesus wants, it removes restraint so that you get to do what you want. And it's just a very deadly, destructive place to land. The rest of that section, all about Sodom and Gomorrah and, you know, the flood and all this stuff, the, the contrast is God ultimately judges those who do evil, but he rescues people out. And so some of us are in positions where we're getting eaten alive. We're in that dark place that I was describing earlier. There are, there's false teaching around. There's proponents. There's advocates of it who not only are breathing in your face saying, you loser, why are you following Jesus? What's your problem? Why are you doing what's right? Well, they don't say that. They say, why are you such a loser? Well, you know, whatever they're saying. We're getting beaten up. We're getting dragged down. And Jesus says, don't buy into the lie because whatever fun they think they're having, which isn't actually that much fun, it will soon come to an end. But the suffering that you're under will also soon come to an end. I will rescue you out of it. And that's the parallel, all those examples he's giving. There's judgment against sickness, wrongness, evil, and there's rescue for those who press into the Lord in each of those Old Testament biblical examples that he gave. Let's pray together. Jesus, I just thank you so much that you, you're against evil. And Lord, everything in our souls just revolves is, is, is our stomachs are turned by the evil that's in our world. The injustices, the atrocities. Lord, we thank you that you're not sitting idly by just letting it all happen. But Lord, you, it, it turns your stomach way more than it turns ours because you see it all and you feel it all much more deeply than we do. And yet, Lord, your goal on this side of the judgment day is not to judge anyone. Your goal is always to draw everyone to places of repentance. And so, Lord, I pray that in each of our lives where we've been influences and influenced and affected and drawn away by false teachings that try to just set us free to do whatever we feel like rather than pressing in in faith because it's worth it. It's worth it. You're coming, and there's a party up ahead. Lord, I just pray you'd strengthen us, ground us in the truth, draw us together in your love, and lead us forward, because it's worth the fight, and it's such an honor to fight shoulder to shoulder with these guys, with this church, your body, as we anticipate the coming, uh, that you have your, your second coming, and the party that will follow. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we say, amen. All right, that was a big mama teaching. We covered a lot of territory. Looking forward to the weeks to come as we'll dive in even more. Talking.